welcome back. I think most people would agree that the Seiko Alpinus line has achieved cult status, and that the Saab 017 has a lot to do with it. Some just dislike that golden green color scheme, but others loved it. And what made the Saab 017 so great was really the value it represented. At the height of its popularity, you could find one for about $400 or less. And at that price, you are not only getting a great go anywhere, do anything kind of watch, but also one with sapphire and upgraded 6R movement, as well as a watch with real history and heritage. So it wasn't really surprising that when Seiko released the limited edition blue version for 600 bucks, that a lot of people were annoyed specifically at the price and pretty much saw it as a cash grab. Now, some saw this as a precursor that they were going to eventually bring back the Alpinus line, which they now have. And today we're gonna review one of those four new models, which is the cream colored SPB-119J1, of which I'm calling mine the Ghost Alpinist. But we should have also seen the writing on the wall with that blue version at its price, that the value the 017 represented was going to be long gone. And looking back, 600 bucks wasn't bad compared to what you're now paying for these new ones. Eventually the prices of these new Alpinists will go down, but we're not sure when or by how much. But right now you're lucky if you pay MSRP, which is close to $700. But I think the big question that most people want to know is it really worth that much? And hopefully by the end of this review, you'll have an answer. All right, so first off, let's go over the specs and dimensions. And if you're familiar with the 017, this is going to be almost identical. It's 39 and a half millimeters wide without the crowns and just over 43 width. So when you combine that with a short lug to lug of about 46, you just get a nice compact watch that should fit most people with slender to medium sized wrists. You also have the same 20 millimeter lug to lug and 200 meters of water resistance. Where things start to differ, however, is in the thickness. And that's all thanks to the addition of both an exhibition case back and a cyclops. So not counting that cyclops, I've measured a total thickness of 13 going from the case back to the top of the sapphire crystal. With the Cyclops, it's much closer to 14. An exhibition case back is always nice, but given the option, I think most people would prefer a closed case back if it makes the watch a little bit thinner. Now, from the comments I got on the unboxing, I think the Cyclops here is the most hated addition to this watch. And initially, I fully agreed with all of you. I'm just not a fan of Cyclopses. I just think it throws off the look and just makes it more difficult to work on. But after spending about a month with it, I do have to admit I didn't mind it near as much as I thought I would. With this cream dial and that white date wheel, there really wasn't any jarring border between them that was being magnified. So it just blended together, and I think it's less noticeable than other watches I've had with one. Not to mention, it can be useful from time to time. The overall finishing of the stainless case is nice, and here you have the top of the case being brushed while the edges are a bit rounded and polished. On both sides there's a polished chamfered edge, and on the left it runs the entire length of the watch, while on the right it transitions into the top of the crown guards. Overall it's a nice case, just classically styled with these long sharp looking lugs that extend out, and it's also a case that just really loves to play with the light. However, I am a bit disappointed in the finish's durability. After about a month, I've already found some micro scratches on the side, and more strangely was on the top of the bezel. Now granted, I'm a little harder on watches than most people, just by all the strap changes and the different surfaces when I do these videos, but I don't think I'm that rough either. I mean, when I look at the Explorient I got just about the same time, it still looks perfect. And one more thing I am disappointed with is that for $700, Seiko still can't give you a proper signed crown. For either of them. Now the crown at the 3 is for the movement and it is screw down. While the one at the 4 controls the internal compass bezel. And that one is not a screw down. Which does kind of confuse me with the 200 meters of water resistance. But if Seiko says it's okay, I guess it's okay. And let's talk about that internal compass bezel, which is really a signature of the Alpinist. First off, the action is pretty good. It's smooth turning and rather responsive, but it might be a bit too responsive, as I've seen it easily change just by accidentally brushing up against the crown. 
However, what I really want to talk about is the alignment or misalignment of the bezel. And this is something that I saw in my unboxing video and just really bugged the hell out of me. So I'm going to spend some time on this. And if you're really not interested, feel free to skip ahead. If the case, dial, and bezel are perfectly lined up, and you happen to rotate the bezel so that one of the four cardinal points are right above an indice, then the other three cardinal points should be above corresponding indices. It's just simple geometry. Yet I discovered that this wasn't the case with mine. As you can see here, north is lined up nicely, but the other three are just further and further off. Given Seiko's recent track record of misaligned bezels and chapter rings pretty much all over the place, this pretty much annoyed the hell out of me when I saw this on the Alpinest. But I didn't really want to jump the gun, so to speak, and start talking about it until I really had a chance to look into it and kind of figure out what's going on. The first thing I was surprised to learn is that this isn't a new issue. I had a lot of SARP 017 owners comment that theirs was also misaligned, and it's been an ongoing issue which surprised me because I hadn't heard this before. What's more curious with mine is that it's not constantly off, and as you rotate the bezel around, it starts to get better before getting worse again. For the sake of time, I'll have a link down below where I'll post some of these still images at the different positions, just for those who really want to examine this. After looking into this a little bit, I think I identified two potential factors that could explain what's going on here. The first is this lateral slop in the movement of the bezel, which you can see here as I rotate the bezel back and forth. It sort of moves towards and then away from the dial, depending on which direction I turn it. And I think this shift could explain some of the misalignment. The other is that the dial may not be perfectly lined up, maybe just off by a degree or two, which really isn't a lot. And if you think about how these watches are assembled, there's got to be just a little bit of wiggle room in how that dial is attached to the movement and then how the movement is then put into the case. And I think that could explain this as well. I also think this happens way more often than we think. And it's really only when you start to zoom in and nitpick on things do you really start to see these imperfections rather than just accepting them and moving on. Now, to be clear, if you're talking about just using the bezel as a compass, none of this really matters. This is more of an issue of paying $700 for a watch and it not being perfect. But the more I started looking into this and the possible causes, the more I started to question if that's really a realistic expectation, or if this is just a potential issue that's inherent in this type of system. So to try and answer that question, I looked at my other compressor style watches, and I currently have seven, and I discovered two things. The first is that the lateral slop that's in the Alpinist is one of the worst. But the other thing I discovered is that none of my other watches are perfectly aligned all of the time. So as much as I want to be annoyed at Seiko and start yelling and ranting about how they screwed up yet again, I'm not really sure I'm justified in doing that. It might make me feel better, but I'm not really justified in that as I haven't really seen anyone else do it any better. And once I realized that and just stopped focusing on it, it really hasn't bothered me anymore. But if you are interested in an Alpinist and you think you'd be overly sensitive to this sort of issue, then my advice is to not even try to buy one online. Try to find one locally so that you can see it first and just see how well it lines up. There were a lot of great nicknames suggested during the unboxing, but I decided to keep calling it the Ghost Alpinist. Mostly because when I look at this dial, it has this white glossy cream color to it, which reminds me more of, say, satin or silk than ice or snow. And there's an extremely faint sunburst effect that's just barely noticeable at times. So when you combine that with the way the light plays off the silver indices, and that there's always this slight green hue from the hands due to all the loom, it just gives the whole thing a little bit of an ethereal look. The dial is just really clean, beautiful, and captivating to look at. The overall layout is identical to the Saab 017, with these slightly raised indices around the dial, with Arabics on the even hours and small pointed triangles for the odd, and those triangles just help draw your eyes right to the center. Now if I had to guess, I'd say the indices are pressed into the back of the dial, rather than say being applied, and that's just like the 017 is which would be another complaint. And it's not that it's cheaper to make, mind you, it's just that a little bit more depth would be a nice touch. 
especially when it's sitting next to a detailed chapter ring that seems to act as a border between a clean, almost dress-like watch interior and an overly complicated field watch exterior. Which is really one of the things people love about the Alpinist series, that it's a dressy field watch that's able to pull double duty. You also have the Seiko logo nicely done at the top, as well as your typical automatic and 20 bar text at the bottom. But one thing that is new is the Prospect logo that's also included down there, and that's because the Alpinist is now included in the Prospect lineup. Although why they've suddenly decided to include it, I have no idea, but you do get to pay a premium for that badge. Now topping everything off, and what always looks fitting on a field watch, is a set of cathedral hands. The length of the hour hand may look a little stubby, as is the style, but the minute and second hand are perfectly proportioned. There's also just something about that second hand, and how it fits sweeping the dial, that I just really love. Overall, just a beautifully designed and made watch. And while I don't think there's as much contrast here as, say, the other versions, I never really had a problem. There just seems to be enough between the silver and the white to easily make out the time. Not to mention, look fantastic doing it. The only thing I didn't like with this dial is the orange that's used for the north on the bezel. It really just looks off to me, and kind of reminds me more of something to do with Halloween. But on to the loom. And before doing any tests, I already knew this had great loom. Just from the way the hands always had a greenish glow to them. The overall design of the loom actually reminds me a lot of the Hamilton Khaki King, which is one reason I chose it for its comparison test. As well as my new Orient Star Outdoor, both of which have pretty good loom for a field watch. Over a three hour test, the hands of all the watches, including the turtle, just seem to track with one another. Yet halfway through that, only the turtle and the alpinist still had their dials illuminated. But the hands still remained consistent, and that stayed that way throughout the entire test. But overall, it's still pretty impressive to see any field watch keep up with a diver, but especially the alpinist. The big difference between the new lineup and the old 017s is the movement, as they went from the older 6R15 to the newer 6R35. Both of which are great movements, with hacking and hand winding, as well as an extended power reserve. With the 6R15 having 50 hours, and this newer 6R35 having 70. But that's something I really wanted to test, and more in a real world fashion. So I tested it twice. The first time was after I'd worn the watch for an entire week. At the end of the day, I just set it down. At which point it ran for another 62 hours. So for the second test, I wore the watch for an entire day, then took it off and wound it 15 times to try to top off the power reserve, before then setting it down to let it run. But at that point, it only ran 60 hours. So while the specs say 70 hours, and it might be capable of that, I never saw it. So I'd say in more real-world use, you'd expect about 60. And as for the accuracy, it's also pretty decent. After a full week, I was only gaining about 7.7 .7 seconds a day. One thing I really love about this watch is that it just looks fantastic with about any strap you can put on it, which I think is one of the advantages of a white dial. But the strap this watch comes with is this black leather number with white stitching, which I think is a really nice soft calf skin, and I think an improvement over the 017 strap. Three of the four colorways come with a leather strap, while the black version that has a little bit different dial comes with a bracelet. Now overall the strap is decent, with a really good deployment clasp. The strap is thick, but not too stiff, and just has a really nice soft feel to it. I think you could wear it on the strap long term without any problems, assuming you get used to the deployment clasp. If you're not used to it, it's a little backwards from what you'd expect, where the excess sort of wraps towards you instead of away. I had a very similar strap on my Orient Star Outdoor, and that's one I wore for a while but then sort of gave up and swapped it to something else, and I'm much happier now without it. So I'll probably do the same with this watch. But regardless, the Alpinist just wears beautifully. It's just about the perfect width for most people, and sits nice and comfortably on the wrist, which is all thanks to that short lug to lug. I do wish it was just a little bit thinner, but I never really found it to be an issue. 
overall, it's just a watch that you can easily wear all day and just forget it's there. Not to mention the 200 meters of water resistance, which just make the Alpinist a striking watch that's easily able to accompany you on just about any journey. Before we start to wrap things up, I do want to quickly talk about aftermarket bracelets, as I know it's an important issue for some. So far you've seen two, and both of those are from Uncle Seiko. One of the reasons I got the cream colored version is that I thought it'd be much more casual than any of the others, but once I put it on a bracelet, I completely changed my mind. It's just drop dead gorgeous. But in preparing for this review, I emailed both Strapcode and Uncle Seiko, and just asked them if the old Owen 7 bracelets would fit these. And Strapcode said that it should, and just to keep an eye on their Instagram for some examples. Well, Uncle Seiko thought they would, but he wasn't quite sure, which is why he generously sent me two so that I could find out. I'll most likely do a full review of these bracelets later, and at some point I will get a Strapcode one for this as well, just to compare. I'm just not sure which one I want to get. Lastly, let's talk value, and this is kind of tricky as the prices are a bit overinflated right now. They should drop at some point, but we don't know by how much or when they will. With current demand, it might be quite a while. Now, the smart decision, of course, is just to wait till those prices drop, but we know a lot of people won't. The Sarb 017s used to cost about $400, and if you're comparing those to these new versions, the only real improvement here, or at least the main justification for that cost, is the new 6R35 movement, which is mostly the same, but just increases the power reserve from 50 to 70 hours. Although realistically, I'm expecting more like 60 hours. But regardless of whether it's a 10 or a 20 hour increase in the power reserve, it's pretty hard to justify the cost increase on that alone. So it's pretty hard here to make any kind of argument on value for this. In fact, if you like the green and gold color scheme, I think you're better off getting an 017 before they're gone. Especially since some retailers have started dropping their prices back down after these new ones came out. However, once those are gone, this is it. And to be clear, I'm not saying you shouldn't buy one of these new Alpinists. It's just there's no real argument for a value proposition here. And I think you should only look at getting one if you're pretty sure it's what you want. And hopefully this has helped you with that. For myself, despite some of the negatives and the nitpickings and even the frustration with the bezel, I really do love it. When it's all said and done, I think the design, sheer comfort, and versatility far outweigh any of the negatives, except for price, of course. I do wish it was a little bit thinner, as well as a little bit cheaper, but it is what it is right now. And if I had to do it all over again, I would. It's just a beautiful and interesting watch to look at, as well as one that's pretty versatile. My advice, of course, is to wait until the price comes down, hopefully closer to 500 bucks but who knows when that'll be. However, if you do get an Alpinist, then you should also be prepared to spend a lot of time and a little bit of money trying out new straps and bracelets, as it just looks brilliant in all of them. And after seeing this, I think I can safely say that the Alpinist legacy and cult status are secured for some time to come. But let me know what you think, not just about the Ghost Alpinist, but about all four new Alpinists. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me.